So in the seventh grade, I got the best gift that I've ever received. In my Christmas tree, ringing loudly, was my very first cell phone. Now, this was in the seventh grade for me, a, a long, distant way ago. And so this phone wasn't like the phones that we have today that we're attached to so much, but this was the best of the best. See, this was not just a flip phone, not just a camera phone, but it had screens on the, the inside and the outside. It had two screens. It was the top, the best of the best, the smartest of the smart dumb phones. Can I just know, is anyone rocking a flip phone? I want to celebrate you. This is not a trick. Nobody wants to own up to that. Okay, um, do we have one over here? Can we celebrate wherever you are that you still, you are smarter than us. Tracy, wonderful. Congratulations. <laughs> So I got this uh, cell phone in the seventh grade, and I loved it. A lot of my friends didn't have it, but I had basketball practice, so at least I justified it to my parents that I had to call them so they could know when to come and pick me up. And so I, I was kind of the cool kid back then, believe it or not, because I had this cell phone. A and I could call people. I, I could text my girlfriends in other states that I met at church camp. Don't judge me. I could get on the Internet without getting that awful dial tone. And so I, I was attached to this thing, man. I loved this smart, dumb phone, this cell phone, this flip phone. It was my lifeblood. I know none of you can relate to any of that, but I, I love this thing. And so I spent all this time with it. And then I remember, uh, I think it was one afternoon after basketball practice, I kind of go through what I, I usually would do and would get done and then uh, open up my gym bag and see how many text messages I had received and missed. And I, I go to look in my gym bag and, and I'm looking all around and it's not there. Now, I'm guessing some of you have had this moment before, this sheer terror of where is my phone? I, I am lost in the world. I cannot connect to anyone. I, I, I don't, it's like I'm back in the Stone Age and I can't even tweet about it. What am I going to do? And so I freak out. And so I'm looking all through the gym bag. I check all my pockets. I can't find it. I, 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 I say, okay, I just need to retrace my steps. So I, I go up into the bleachers. I look around there. I, I open up the middle school boys' locker room. There's that, you know, gust of Axe body spray. And I kind of sift through that. And, and I go and I look all around my locker and it's not there. And then I, I go to the, the bench where I spent most of my time playing basketball. And I look all around there. And there's nothing. And so I, I, I took a deep breath. I said, you know what, all I'm going to have to do, I'm going to have to go up to the front office, I'm going to find a nice lady, I'm going to tell the nice lady, I lost my cell phone, the nice lady's going to pull out a nice lost and found box, and then she's going to hand it to me, and angels will sing, and all will be fine and well in the world. Now, I, I, so I do that, I, I go and I walk to the office, and I find the nice lady, and I say, Miss Nice Lady, I lost my cell phone. And, and she does what I thought she would do, she reaches down, she pulls out the box, but then she asks me a question that I wasn't quite expecting. See, I thought she would just say, okay, here's your cell phone, and it would all go on the way. But she asked me this question. She said, before I give it to you, I've got to know, what does it look like? And at first I thought that was kind of a strange question. It kind of caught me off guard. But then I realized, you know what? I have spent so much time with this cell phone, I can tell you everything about it. I can tell you the brand, I can tell you the color, I can tell you what wallpaper's on, I can tell you what games are on, I can tell you where the scratches and nicks are, because you remember I was in middle school, so I was dropping that thing a lot. I can tell you everything about this phone, because I had spent so much time with it. I knew what it looked like. And she said, in order to claim it as yours, you have to know what it looks like. Now, I tell you that because in this series that we're calling Reclaiming Christmas, that's one of the primary things that we as Christ followers have to do is that in order to look at Christmas and say Christmas is ours, we have to be able to say exactly what it looks like in order to claim it. And so that, that's kind of the mission that we worked through last week and we're going to be working over the next three weeks is what does Christmas look like? And then how do we sift through all of the cultural expectations and the cultural norms and all those things that kind of cloud the true meaning of Christmas to then look in to see what it is really about? And so this morning, we're going to be looking at something that the culture says that you should be doing this Christmas season. And anytime, and this is a refresher from last week, but anytime we go into the culture, anytime we step out of these walls, which we do a lot, and encounter something that is not explicitly of God, we've got to evaluate it. We've got to send it through a Christian filter to see how do we take this or how do we reject this or what do we do with this stimuli 
to live our faith as Christians in the culture. And if you remember last week, I gave you three pretty clear guidelines of what it means to engage the culture as Christians. The first, and it's there in your notes, is to reject what is evil. It's to reject what is evil. There are some things that that are evil, that are of the enemy, that are untrue, that are just plain and simply bad. And so we as Christians must prima facie, before any other knowledge, reject those things. Things like human trafficking, things like pornography, things like murder, things like theft, things like cats. We've got to look at those things (laughs) and say no. The second thing we do as Christians is to receive what is good. We reject what is evil and we receive what is good. And that may seem like a really intuitive thing to do, but you'd be surprised with how many Christians and how there's this kind of holy struggle of what to receive as good. See, some Christian traditions will say that the only thing that can be good is if it happens in the confines of a church and if it has explicitly Christian undertones. That would mean that really good things like coffee, like football, like a sunset, like a baby sleeping, that are good things, they would say reject. But we know as Wesleyan Christians that those are all part of what's called prevenient grace. That means that God pours down his grace upon us in many, many different ways, not just with the empty tomb of Jesus Christ, but with a warm cup of coffee on a Tuesday morning. Those are all good gifts that we can receive as Christians. The third thing that's involved in cultural engagement is to redeem what is broken. To find those things that aren't pure evil, that aren't pure good, but they're somewhere in the middle, and God has called us through his redemptive work in Jesus Christ to participate in that action of redeeming the world around us. That's the story of Christmas. That God didn't send a flood like he did with Noah to wipe out the world as evil. He saw that there was sin that could not be called good, so he comes and he redeems And many of the cultural practices around Christmas are about redeeming those things. That's what we talked about last week in gift giving. How we can faithfully give gifts around this time of year as Christians. And this morning we're going to talk about something that kind of underlies and is underneath all of the different cultural stuff that we have going on this Christmas season. My guess is it's going to hit a lot of us pretty hard, so strap in. You see, around this time of year, if we're not careful, and even if we are... Stress, busyness, hurry, too much to do in too little time can become an idol for us. It can become something that is all-consuming to where we can't see what Christmas is really about because that would take time and we don't have it. And so I, I, I'm very passionate about this because I think that not only is our modern American pace just completely out of control and unsustainable, but I also believe that it goes directly in contrast to the way that Jesus has called us to live. In other words, when we make stress that idol, we're forgetting the true godness of Jesus Christ. And the scary part is that this is a uniquely Western and this is a uniquely American problem. Because here's what the stats say. You know I like stats. 55% of Americans report that they are stressed during any given day. That number seems low to me. About one of, out of every three Americans will see a doctor this year for something stress-related, like headaches, muscle pain or tension, chest pain, fatigue, upset stomach, sleep problems, anxiety, lack of motivation or focus, irritability or anger. It sounds like the end of a bad pharmacy commercial when the reality is that's just what's happening in your everyday life. 94% of American workers report experiencing stress at the workplace. Uh, My guess is that if I asked this room, for those of you who work, uh, who feels stressed at work, my guess is it would probably be a little bit higher than 94%. And the reason that's true is because we live in a country and we live in a culture that promotes this as some sort of good. That this is an ideal that we're supposed to live up to. We're supposed to be stressed because if we're not, then we're not doing something right. Americans work longer hours than any other industrialized nation on the planet. At least 134 countries have set the maximum length of the work week. 
The United States has not. Over 85% of men and 66% of women work more than 40 hours per week. And according to one study, Americans work 137 more hours per year than Japanese workers, 260 more hours per year than British workers, and 499 more hours per year than French workers. We are working ourselves to death because the culture says this is what you have to do. And then pile on top of that, not just work. Pile on top of that relationships and paying bills and children and keeping a spouse happy and responsibilities at church and responsibilities outside of work and mowing the lawn and doing the dishes and, and, and all of those things that seem to crush us on top of social media, on top of a 24-hour news cycle that will always give you something to be worried about. We are running ourselves thin and then it's Christmas time. More pageants. More events, more parties, more family, more cleaning, more buying, more returning, and then more buying again, over and over and over again. This is the time of year that we are the most stressed and the most busy and the most hurried. And I read one article by Paul David Tripp this week that said that when we make Christmas busyness into an idol, what we're doing is saying that if we're not busy, then we haven't made it. The culture will say that when you're scrolling through your Instagram feed or when you're on a web browser and an advertisement comes up for something that you can't afford, if you can't afford it, there's something wrong with you. If there's a cool gift and you don't have someone to buy it for, there's something wrong with you. Do more, spend more, buy more, give more, over and over and over again. And it's flat out exhausting us. And it's not the way that Jesus has called us to live. There was an article that came out last year by the Mayo Clinic that gave tips for this holiday season. It was called Stress, Depression, and the Holidays. Tips for Coping. We've gotten to a point now that we're not trying to be joyous even of a holiday season. We're just trying to cope with it. And I can't help but look at that and say that something is wrong. There in your notes, what happens when we get so addicted to busyness and so addicted to the things of this earth is that we reverse the purpose of the incarnation. Stick with me here. See, the story of Christmas is that God himself has come down and put on human flesh to rescue us from physical and material things. To rescue us from the bondage of this world and to bring us up into a relationship with him. But when we become so fixated on the things of this world, then we become even more bonded to these things. Jesus has come to rescue us, but in our busyness we say, we know better and I'm going to do more and I'm going to prove you wrong. There's something wrong there. In Luke chapter 2, we looked at it last week, the angels began proclaiming to the shepherds this good news of Jesus' coming. And we'll pick it up in verse 13, just a continuation of what we read last week. It says, And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, and they praised God, and they said, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth, listen to this, peace. Peace among those with whom he is pleased. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste, with hurry. And they found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. Listen, the shepherds were in a hurry, but the only thing they were in a hurry to do is to get to Jesus's side. They had a lot of other stuff to do. They had sheep to tend. They had flocks to move. But instead they said, I'm going to be hurried about one thing, and that's being in the presence of the one who is going to bring me peace. Because this is the message that Jesus brings. He says, my peace I give unto you. Not like the world gives peace, like I will give it to you. And this message that Jesus brings is not, it's very good news, but it's not new news. Because if you go all the way back to the very first book of your Bible, Genesis 1, or Genesis 2, we see that God has built into the rhythm of creation a need for peace and a need for rest. 
Genesis 2, verse 1. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done and he rested on the seventh day from all the work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and he made it holy because on it, God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. We forget that God rested on the seventh day. And the thing is, is God rested not because he was tired, not because he was spent from all the work that he had done. He didn't rest because he needed it. God rested on the seventh day because he knew that you would. Rest is a gift that we are given, and yet we say, no, I don't need it. I know better. God knew that we would do this. So what does he do? He puts it in the Ten Commandments. Honor the Sabbath and keep it holy. That means take rest. And my guess is that if I went to you and went through the Ten Commandments, you would say doing most of them is beyond the thought, uh, uh, the thought world that you have. If I said, would you ever kill somebody? You'd say, oh, no, that's crazy. Would you ever break in somewhere and steal something? Oh, no, I would never do that. Would you ever not take a day off? Same book, same tablets, same commandments, but we think we know better. God has given us rest, and he knew that we would need a reminder of this peace. So then he sends Jesus. And what's Jesus' message? He says in Matthew 11, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus says, following after me, truly following after me means rest means peace, means setting aside that calendar and living and dwelling with me. And I think such an easy way that I've seen kind of a warped version of the Protestant work ethic, which in itself is a decent thing to say, hey, pick up yourself by your bootstraps, do some work and get it done. We've taken that way far to the extremes, so much that the word busy and the word good have come to mean the same thing. Busy it should be a bad four-letter word, but instead it means the same as good. If you don't believe me, think about it this way. In one of those throwaway conversations that you probably have a dozen times a day at the water cooler in the hallway, somebody asks you this question. They say, hey, how's it going? Hey, how, how, how are you doing? My guess is that you give one of two answers. What's one? Good and then busy. And somehow those are two of the same things. We don't stop in those moments and say, so glad you asked. My children will be the death of me. My husband, I've asked him plenty of times. He still hasn't done what he said he's going to do. Work is driving me nuts. My car broke down last week, and I have a growth back here. Would you mind looking at it? We don't say that. We give these short one-word answers that mean the same thing. We say good or busy, or if you're an overachiever, you say good, busy. And somehow, th th this is a good thing. I I've tried to start to rid myself of this vocabulary. That when someone asks you, hey, how's you, how, you, how you doing? How are things going? Say, I'm blessed. Say, I'm great. How are you? Try to take that word busy out of your vocabulary. Because when you start speaking it, you start living into it. If you start telling people that you're stressed and that you're busy, you know what? You're going to feel more stressed and busy. Let's rid ourselves of that vocabulary as we seek to follow after the way of Jesus this Christmas season. Now, I understand that I've kind of just railed on you for 20 some odd minutes about how you need to slow down. And so I want to tell you right now, I have in no way figured this out. If there's a hypocrite here today, hand up, it's me. I work on average, 50 to 60 hours a week. I've got two young girls at home, not to mention the most extroverted wife on the planet. There is no downtime. I am really, really bad at rest. So if you can feel convicted by the message, I did a good job, but know that I feel convicted as well. I have in no way figured this out. 
But in closing, I do want to help you to begin to consider how particularly this Christmas season we can start getting into the patterns of the way of Jesus. And let me say before I give these that, that me saying Jesus calls you to rest and you need to rest is not an excuse to shuck all of your responsibilities. Okay, if you call in to work tomorrow and you say, my pastor told me to stay at home and take a nap, do some Tai Chi and figure out whatever this Mandalorian thing is on Disney+, Plus, you might not have a job on Tuesday. Don't blame me, okay? It's not an excuse to just shut down and do nothing. But there are really subtle ways that we as a people can pattern ourselves against the culture and begin to live the rest-filled and restful lives that God has called us to live. I want to give you three suggestions. You, you don't have to use any of these, but there's three suggestions, and they're there at the bottom of your uh, notes. Number one is this, and I have a sticky note on my monitor that says this. Grow your no so that God can bless your yes. Grow your no so that God can bless your yes. Friends, we've got to start saying no to more things. Uh, I, 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 I preached the same message on Thursday night at Lakeway, and I had a lot of people say, hey, this was really convicting. And, and the scary part to me is that most of those people who came up to me, they were in their teens. Parents, your stress and your busyness has a trickle-down effect. And so we've all got to be better about looking not at the quantity of things that we're doing, but the quality of things that we're doing. And that means saying no to some things. That means saying no to some good things. My guess is that a lot of people in here, you're not sitting back thinking I could, you know, rob the bank or I could get that drug deal done this week. Like, no, you're going to have to say no to some good things. And you're going to have to be okay with it. Because when you start getting intentional about your time, and that's number two, is to get intentional. When you start getting intentional about what goes on your calendar, you're going to see God bless those things that you say yes to. If you don't take control of your calendar, someone else will. The culture will rip at you and tell you what you need to do when. We'll give you shows that you just have to watch. We'll give you events that you just have to be at. But if you get intentional, especially parents, about creating those memorable moments, you're going to see God still your heart and bless your family. Family traditions don't just happen. They take somebody being intentional and saying, tonight we're doing this together. We're going to go drive and look at Christmas lights. We're going to read the Christmas story together. We're going to pray together. We're going to go caroling. We're going to make cookies for our neighbors. Do something intentional and then see how God blesses it. And the last thing, and it's kind of a precursor to the sermon um, that we're going to preach next week, but the last thing is this, and look right at me. Give yourself grace. Give yourself grace. There's a lot of events. There's a lot of things. There's a lot of things to buy. There's a lot of people to see, most of whom you don't even want to see. There's so much to do this Christmas season, but when you say no, you can't feel guilty about it. You've got to give yourself grace because you cannot do it all. That's that bottom line there in your notes. You're going to put... I cannot do it all. You need to sign your name by that. Go ahead and do it. You can't do it all. And listen, that's okay because no one can. Because the message of Christmas is that you don't have to do it all. The message of Christmas is that Jesus Christ, the baby in the manger, would grow up and say, you don't have to do it all because I'm going to do it for you. You don't have to work for your righteousness. You don't have to work for your salvation. He said, you know what? I'm going to give it to you. This Christmas season in your faith as well is not about how much you can do and how much you can fit into your calendar. It's about sitting back. It's about resting. It's about receiving the gift of grace that God has given to you and he has given to me. Let me pray for us. Father, we thank you. That